I'm a success consultant with Landmark Information. Um, I've worked with Landmark for over 11 years. And um, <clears throat> Claire, if we could have my slide, my opening slide. Um, uh, and what I'm going to talk through to, with you today is our Landmark's Financial Asset Search, or, and I've put in brackets, FAS, as um, that's often how it gets shortened. Um, and really what I want to do is to demonstrate how this um, tracing tool and report um, seeks to find vital information regarding assets as part of the probate service. As I said, I've been with Landmark for 11 years and was very much at the concept of financial asset search and, you know, I've, I've spoken with many probate um, solicitors and, and probate professionals on understanding their needs. Um, so hopefully we can demonstrate that. Next slide. Um, so as we said in the invitation, um, recent survey um, was the end of last year um, indicated that almost half of UK adults um, had confirmed that they didn't really know where they would go to look whether there were any assets associated with um, a lost one. And <clears throat> can you go back a slide? Is that okay? Sorry, thank you. Um, and so hence, you know, the uh, financial asset search is, we feel is a, is a really good tool to help with that very um, needy purpose, if you like. So over the, the next uh, 30 minutes, what I want to look at is uh, the background of Landmark Financial, financial Asset Search, you know, where it uh, came from and what its aims are, or were and are. Um, we're going to look at lost and dormant accounts because they often get spoken about, uh, um, understand what that really is and what happens to those unclaimed assets if they're never claimed. Um, we're going to look at um, the various sources of data that uh, uh, make up the financial asset search report um, and that will include the new keys data which we feel is a really really important piece of uh, added data. Um, we're then going to look at really who can order financial asset search and the process to do so um, uh, and then finally I'm going to talk through the benefits of using this service for both you and your clients um, and particularly as now is you know, we find ourselves in this very odd situation working from home, not being able to operate perhaps in the normal way that we've always done. Um, and this is a service that will allow you to access information um, or at least uh, try and find uh, asset information for you, um, you know, sat uh, behind your laptop. Um, and things obviously, you know, not just about the situation, but obviously our lives become more complex. So, um, again, another good reason for adding this tool to, to your service. Um, and then I finally, I'm going to let our clients uh, have their say that, that, uh, about their experience of using this search. Thank you, Claire. So, uh, what is Landmark FAS? Well, um, the, the search was actually created by two ex-city bankers who um, were very much aware of the value of assets that were sat within banks' dormant account systems. And these were funds from what was classed as uninitiated accounts. Uh, and they sat there unclaimed. And um, back in the day, that they were said to be worth 15 billion. Oddly, it's still quoted at 15 to, to 20 billion. But they realised that most people probably wouldn't ever be aware if there was an account, if they could find no paperwork and how they would access them if they did discover something. Uh, they also understood the frustrations from the um, uh, professional, probate professionals and their aim was to support those professionals and executors with their duties um, and HMRC requirements and in particular in avoiding any um, penalties for not including all the assets before uh, they declare to, to HMRC. And what they wanted to do was to create a single search which could access um, banks and other financial institutions as to whether they held any accounts within the deceased name within those uh, dormant accounts and then seeking support from Landmark who uh, even then was, were known for their data uh, facilities and for their technology. Um, you know, this brought Landmark into it to help them get that process uh, driven and uh, together they worked um, to provide this solution and Landmark Financial Asset Search was launched in 2009. Um, 
Now the search has developed over the years um, and uh, as I said you know as I worked with uh, probate solicitors and professionals over the years of sort of introducing them to the report but also finding out exactly what their frustrations were what other information they would require it's allowed us to add um, uh, other pieces of useful information so things like adding the pensions from department of work and pensions shares information which i used to get asked all the time about you know how frustrating it was to, to confirm if there was any shares information to add to the assets um, and also there was the unclaimed assets register was out there in the market and uh, would be really useful we could combine all of them so it's about working with the people that are using um, the report to help make sure that it works for you um, as we go forward but it also included um, providing a search of a will register and we've really felt that uh, these two vital pieces of information went hand in hand uh, now, without spoiling um, Astrid's uh, piece on um, certainty will register, um, I really just wanted to kind of um, demonstrate why we uh, we added that piece of information. So, Claire, thank you. Um, so, I, um, forgive me, Astrid, if I get some of this um, a little bit wrong, but I believe it was <laughs> certainty was set up pretty much the same time. So. Um, very much the conception of certainty and landmark financial asset search were pretty much around the same time. Uh, Certainty's aim, we understood then, was to build a national will register um, because back then there wasn't one in place. Um, and they've been very, very good at um, making sure that that, that worked for, for everybody in, in concerns. And so over the next 10 years, they've worked with probate solicitor firms as well as uh, general public, I believe, to increase the number of registrations held. And um, I, I I'm sure I'll get the numbers wrong, but I believe it's something like 30,000 when I remember back in the day. And now we're talking over 8 million. And I'm sure Astrid will update you with those figures anyway. But they have become the National World Register that they aimed at, and, and endorsed by the Law Society. So the synergy between landmark and certainty in providing a service to the same client base was clear and so we felt that it was a really good uh, part to include as part of the landmark financial asset search thank you claire now as uh, probate professionals you'll be aware of the arduous task of ensuring you've discovered all those assets um, and this can sometimes seem like looking for a needle in a haystack um, now, before anybody looks at my image on the slide and says, hang on, that's straw, you're right, it is straw because somebody has pointed that out to me already, but, you know, hence that's what Google provided for me, so um, you'll get my gist. Um, and obviously, like we've learned from um, talking with uh, probate professionals that evidence can be found if you're searching a property um or any family pa paperwork and that might be statements or flyers you know good goodness i've even heard stories about some of the actual funds that are secretly hidden within properties as well but if, of course it comes down to how you uh, then investigate what you can and what you can't see to make sure that you've not actually missed anything um, <clears throat> and a recent case was you know the, the whole reasoning behind um the financial asset search is to to look for those things that don't seem so obvious um <clears throat> and so you know what i found was obviously that could mean multiple searches to, when you're trying to discover mis those missing assets uh, means you requirement to write to individual banks and pension funds etc um, and then the frustrations um, of proving that you're acting on the deceased estate that was some comment that I got quite a lot um, and also the risk of any liability for for yourself for your client uh, or any beneficiaries and in, in not making sure that you've been as diligent as you possibly can and then finding out you know down the line that uh, you've missed a whole chunk of assets and that kind of has to all be recorded and uh, hopefully uh, you know any penalties um, dealt with um, and of course this all means time and time means cost when you're searching for, for things like that through bankers uh, institutions etc and making sure that you're compliant along the way thank you claire 
So we feel that the landmark financial asset search is a, an obvious choice to support you. And I, I don't need to um, remind you of your duties as an executor because you'll all be very much aware of that from valuing the state through to the distribution um, of that estate. Um, but it's also that you ensure that you've declared everything properly to HMRC and that it's, it's correct, it's not undervalued before you go ticking the right boxes and signing away that you have checked every possible avenue and that you've delivered this um, in the said deadline. So this is where the um, report, financial asset search report comes into its own, we believe. Um, it's there uh, as a service to support uh, executors. It's to seek out those financial financial assets that an individual has held in their lifetime. It's a service which can only be offered to regulated legal professionals um, as part of our terms and conditions and to ensure that we comply with the state administration banking protocol, um, which is a set of procedures which are agreed with the Law Society, Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners and British Bankers Association is to clarify and speed up a state administration process. Um, currently, we only do it for solicitors and legal professionals that can search on deceased persons. Uh, we get asked time and time again whether we can use it in other ways um, and we're currently looking to how we can make sure that that happens. Um, and we obviously make sure that we comply with all the GDPR, um, uh, which mainly obviously applies to the living um, and make sure that we uh, follow the processes correctly. Thank you, Claire. So um, this diagram uh, demonstrates how the financial asset search plays its part in the process. And Claire, you can just one more click. Hopefully it will follow through. So it's very much part of that gathering of the full details of the state's assets and also debts uh, before you complete any inheritance tax returns um, and then going through to the grant of probate and finally distributing the estate according to the instructions left in the will to those beneficiaries. Um, so it's something that can be done pretty much at the start and make sure that you're in line uh, for those deadlines. Thank you, Claire. So lost and dormant accounts. Um, I've got a mitt when I first started um, uh, with financial asset search, I didn't know what a lost and dormant account was and, and, and quite clearly a lot of people don't know either. Um, but back in uh, 2008, the Dormant Bank and Building Society Accounts Act was set up and this was to allow the banking institutions to place any uninitiated or unused, if you like, accounts into dormant accounts. Um, if they've not been initiated or unused for a different uh, particular periods of time. So um, that means that you've not gone in and looked at the account even. So if you've <clears throat> it's uninitiated um, after one year, which is tends to be for current accounts or three to five years for the sort of standard savings accounts, um, you will often it may have happened to you if you've forgotten that you've got this lovely lump of money sat, sat in an in account um, that you've not, not bothered to touch, but you will get prompted by the bank to ask, ask if you uh, want to continue with it being open or placed into a dormant account and you know you just have to reinitiate that um, and that's how it works. But those funds are protected so as rights of the owners you can reclaim it whenever you need to and, and you definitely it's theirs, it's not going to be taken away from you. But um, if there's no uh, customer initiation of that particular account after 15 years and there's no transaction those funds under the Dormant Bank and Building Society Accounts Act can be transferred and distributed to the benefit of the community. Now, as I said at the beginning, there's 15 to 20 billion, they say, of unclaimed financial assets. So um, I'm sure community funds will be you know, welcome of that type of, of funding. But these, um, if you can click, Claire, um, funds are collected and dealt with through a body called the Reclaim Fund Limited. Um, and they in turn distribute that to the National Lot Lottery Act. Um, and this is a community fund that was set up in, in 2006. And they in turn um, have a responsibility to distribute money to various projects across 
uh, England, uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, one such um, uh, group is the Big Society Trust, which is often spoken about, and it's an independent social investment wholesaler within England and, as I say, similar projects across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. Um, and some of that funding um, is currently being used uh, to fund uh, charity work um, at this time um, of COVID-19. So I guess it's a great way to think that you know, if you die and you've left funds in an account that nobody knows about and nobody ever discovers, um, it will eventually do some good um, if you want to look at it, it, it that way. But obviously from probate, you want to make sure that uh, you've checked to see if it, uh, there's any for your clients, deceased loved one. Thank you, Claire. So where do we search? Well, for the reunification of unknown assets, uh, the Landmark FAS um, is a single search uh, which provides notification of death to over 200 financial organisations at that one time, and it requests confirmation of any accounts in the deceased name. Um, and then we will, um, they will send back any information or that they don't hold uh, accounts as part of the uh, report. We also trace a wide range of other assets, which would uh, include personal pensions, uh, life policies, investment bonds, unit and investment trusts, and also the national savings and investments. Alongside that, um, as we mentioned before, we, we look for occupational pensions via the Department of Work and Pensions. And as part of the um, completion of your uh, submission of a search, you would need to fill in some uh, further detail there. Uh, also, as we said, we look for the latest will via Certainty National Will Register. And we've also um, <clears throat> got a unique database of shareholder records. Um, and this is um, gives us a, a, the ability to look through these records on for authorised FTSE 100 shareholdings that are registered with Capita, Computer Share and Equinity or it's known as, as the big three. So really useful information. As I said, lots of people really keen to get that information. Um, so grateful when we did add it. And then alongside that, the unclaimed assets register. Now this is it's more experienced data. Um, it, it holds over, I think it's now something like 4.5 million records of individuals with unclaimed monies. Um, and recently, um, Sita from uh, informed me that they actually found £44,000 in an endowment policy. Um, and like I said, it's sometimes those sort of things that you don't think about, so things like endowment policies, it perhaps wouldn't come to mind when you're trying to scrabble together where you think your loved one's uh, funds were kept or have been part of a, a, any uh, finances. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's, uh, it, and some really vital data there to make sure that everything uh, is searched and can come back to you. Um, and hence then we've added the keys data, which um, is, we've waited uh, a couple of years to get, but is finally here. And uh, next slide, please, Claire. And we feel this um, really does add another piece uh, to this asset puzzle. Um, because it allows us to have a fuller, better picture of the deceased personal details um, and very much uh, in line with, you know, the um, active and inactive accounts that they've held. Um, it brings uh, information in regards to things like mortgages, obviously current account accounts and any overdrafts. Also credit, uh, whether they've had any loans or like the credit cards or other credit facilities but also whether there's any outstanding payments, which is um, really uh, useful information, as you will be aware. Um, also, last known addresses uh, and any previous addresses, any aliases, if there are, that are associated with the deceased, um, and also things like bankruptcies, insolvencies, and county court judgments. So a really, as I say, rounder picture and another piece to the puzzle so you can look and see that information and uh, take it forward for, for the next part of the process. Thank you, Claire. Um, so when I was um, putting together these webinars, um, I thought it'd be really, really useful to go and talk to the people that um, currently use the financial asset search um, in their probate service and ask them when did they mostly use it, because I was aware that it's obviously not in every case. Um, the 
number one answer was when they're acting executor and the reason obviously behind that is that they felt it was allow it allowed them to be providing the best due diligence for their clients but also protecting them um, with any liabilities to know that they checked in every possible place and every possible avenue um, they also spoke of for estates valued in excess of 250,000 and that figure sort of varied um, depending on the firm but it kind of all came down to that was a limit that uh, most associated with uh, when the estate may be liable for inheritance tax, which may seem obvious, but often that was because they already were aware of the situation and the likelihood of inheritance tax needs. Um, where an estate is complex, so where there may have been previous business partnerships or they, there was definitely a business partnership in place, or divorces, previous marriages, where obviously the complexities were already there. Um, when acting for charities, named them as beneficiaries, so those who act for charities felt this is a really useful search um, and hopefully um, we'll be able to sort of go down that avenue a little bit further with uh, for further data for that. Um, intestate cases or where there's no dependents mentioned in the will um, and also uh, for some firms if the estate contains uh, businesses we spoke but also agricultural assets. And although most of them said we don't use it in every case, um, most of them did recommend it or put it part of their um, client uh, care information and explaining why the financial asset search was uh, really useful uh, to provide a complete set of records as possible as uh, part of the probate process. Thank you, Claire. So um, we don't or we won't know how much is discovered or what's discovered because the report will come you know, straight back to you as the probate professional. So you get to see what's been identified. Um, but occasionally firms will um, allow us to uh, in, an insight into something they've discovered. And it may be like this one have sort of funny sort of. Uh, tell behind it or that uh, simply it's been amazing you know what's been discovered um, so this one sort of stuck in my memory from sort of about three or four years ago it was um, a vicar that died um, from a short illness um, and the couple uh, had been married for 40 years and his wife like I guess all wives and partners assume she knew all about the assets all about his business and you know felt she had everything there that she needed to provide to uh, take forward the probate process. But this, the firm uh, recommended the financial asset search um, because they felt it was their best service in supporting her as an executor. Um, what they discovered, and if you can click, thank you Claire, is that they firstly, a small amount within a pension fund, but to her big surprise, £30,000 in an unknown to her Halifax Building Society account. Um, now, oh, boss, you Sorry. know, 30, okay. <laughs> well, £30,000 is a lovely surprise. Um, it really does demonstrate that, you know, we, we don't always know. We can assume we know, but we don't always know about someone's uh, financial dealings across there. Uh, their lives and that they may have um, you know had uh, savings elsewhere that you were unaware of so uh, you know this time it was really really useful for the financial asset search to discover this uh, so who can order a financial asset search well uh, it's quite clear on the screen about which bodies we allow under our terms and conditions to uh, for you to be under uh, um, so if you're regulated the law society or uh, um, England, Wales or Scotland, uh, through STEPS, Society of Trust and State Practitioners, through um, the uh, CLC or Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, uh, we will um, allow you to access the financial asset search. As I say, this is um, in line with our terms and conditions and it can't be accessed by um, a lay executor or the general public, it's really just for yourselves as probate professionals. So how do you order? Well, it's really, really quite simple. Um, it's uh, you go to landmarkfas.co.uk and you can register within minutes by just providing a few details about yourself and your company. 
once we've done our uh, verification due diligence we will issue you with your login that will come back to you and then you're ready to search um, as part of every search we uh, require a copy of the death certificate and a letter of authority is to make sure that the data that we're using will allow us to do so. Now you'll see as part of um, the piece there that says about the um, evidence, they say grant of probate and letter of administration. We realize that that's probably the wrong way around because you need to know the assets uh, before you get the grant, grant of probate, but um, the data provider uh, insist that we put that on there. Now we can provide you with uh, a form to have as your letter of authority for you to complete and sign or you can use your own version of that. Uh, but once you've completed the details um, of your deceased, um, uploaded your evidence, we can then start the search. Um, and that search then goes out to all those financial institutions and within 28 days um, you will receive uh, the results in a comprehensive report with uh, the front page highlighting uh, any particular areas where uh, there's been um, assets identified. But it doesn't just stop there after day 28, we continue to monitor for the further 90 days and the reason being that we, it, it allows us to make sure there's no late coming information um, from any of the institutions that you know, would get otherwise get missed. So we will update you with any information that uh, if that happens. But it also means that it can still be with um, in a good deadline for um, your uh, HMRC uh, form uh, declaration. So to the benefits, um, <clears throat> we truly do believe that this tracing tool offers you peace of mind. Uh, as a, a probate solicitor um, and also to your clients when you're settling the affairs of um, a person's estate um, it's providing you with complete due diligence and um, allows you to do an all-in-one search for assets um, financial assets through you know that single request and so multiple searches through that single request Hence then that eliminates that need to write to those individual banks or other financial institutions directly. It saves you time and cost. All that information comes back to you so that you can read through and know where you can direct uh, any further information that you require. Um, it reduces the risk of fraud because we're asking for notification um, of, of death so uh, and authorities to make sure that we're dealing with the right people and that the uh, institutions know that too. And that protects yourselves, your client and any beneficiaries by making sure that you've looked in every avenue and that you've followed um, uh, the, uh, the compliancy right through um, and um, nothing's going to uh, rear its ugly head a bit later on. It's a fixed fee, so it's um, easy to explain uh, what that involves to your client. You know, we're not asking to recover any percentage from any funds you recover. Um, and obviously it all complies with the state administration banking protocol to ensure that we do things the right way. So finally, uh, before I hand over to Astrid and for her to talk to you um, about certainty, um, I'm going to leave you to just read through a couple of um, comments from um, some satisfied landmark financial asset users who really do believe it supports them in their probate service. And I'd just like to say thank you for listening and uh, say if you have any questions then we can uh, answer those at the end of the main session. Thank you. Lovely. So Thank you ever so much, Ali, for um, the lovely start to the webinar today. And thank you to the Bristol Law Society for hosting uh, this webinar. So I hope you're keeping safe and well at this rather challenging time for us all and uh, found, hopefully now found a new way to work safely in the current new normal. I think that's what people are terming the situation at the moment. Um, so I'm Astrid Bowser I'm from Certainty the National Will Register. 
by way of update, um, I joined the company back in 2010, at the beginning of 2010, when the National Will Register was gaining traction amongst the leading law firms who wanted to help build a National Will Register and Will Search service for the United Kingdom. Today I'll be giving you a succinct overview on the increasing importance of searching for deceased personal documentation quickly, safely and of course now remotely how and why there has been an increase in the demand in will search during COVID-19, the positive effects of how your will registrations are helping the recently believed during lockdown, and finally just understand what tools you have available to use <clears throat> right now from your own home as a wills and probate professional, including an, an initiative that we take advantage of every year um, from the National Will Register. So um, it's lovely to see that we can be quite interactive on this presentation um, and I did want to have a little pause and think um, how many wills you think had been registered at the start of um, 2010 um, but Ali had kindly um, given a little bit of a hint <laughs> and I think, the, I think the slides might have given away a bit of a hint <laughs> of jumping ahead. So, um, so yes, yeah, so when, um, when I joined the company in 2010 um, there was even though it's still considered quite a large number there was 34,000 uh, wills on the register and um, that's sort of leading me on to where we are now and um, this does make you think okay well how many wills are on the register at present so as of Friday um, and we can go on to the next slide please Thank you. So as of Friday last week, there were um, 8,622,969 wills within the National Will Register system. So um, it's quite an impressive number. Um, most people seem to be quite shocked when we say this. Um, I'm not too sure why, because, um, you know, we have been, um, we've been beating the drum of the importance of registering wills and searching for a will for um, over 13 years now. Um, but this has only been achieved with um, working with thousands of law firms like yourselves and the will writing professionals in the UK to register the existence of their clients' wills. And that is for one purpose only, and that is to make sure the latest valid will of your client is found quickly and confidentially at the time it is needed. And just on this slide here, I've just laid a couple of um, key milestones on our milestones on our journey um, to will, will registration to get to that 8 million number um, and the ones that stand out to me is that in one day we managed to register 47,327 wills from one firm and over the course of three days we managed to register 103,000 wills. So just as a final thought before I continue um, on to the next slide, I just want you to think about your own personal circumstances as a legal professional. So does your firm have wills in its storage right now, but it is highly likely that the client has unfortunately passed away and yet no one has come forward to collect that will, or there is no knowledge internally at your firm that the will has been superseded elsewhere? I then want you to think ahead to the unfortunate time that a will is needed, and have you ever questioned whether the estate is indeed intestate or the will presented is the latest will? Or has the client simply not known if there is a will or another will? So great example, Ali, with the vicar. The vicar's wife did not know that he had £30,000 in a savings account. Um, on the surface, you would assume that they would. Um, so are you finding these situations even more challenged to um, uh, draw conclusions in this current climate? So if you have in your eternal monologue um, just now answered yes or I'm not sure, um, I will be able to summarise in this webinar how the remotely accessible will registration and will search services can help you. So could I go on to the next slide please Claire? So it's announced by the government that particular legal professionals are key workers during the COVID-19 outbreak. These workers are deemed as essential to the running of the justice system, and quite rightly so. One of the categories was solicitors acting in connection with the execution of wills. As we're continuously reminded at this time, the pandemic has brought end-of-life administration to the forefront of people's minds. So coupled with arguably a little bit more time on their hands whilst at home, 
and more wills are being executed at this time. Um, we have got a little bit of time at the end of the webinar, but I'd be really interested to see how um, you as professionals are um, finding innovative ways to presently execute wills. So here at Certainty, the, sorry, we're just on the back slide, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so at the Certainty National Will Register, we exist to support wills and probate professionals and their clients. We have in place a crisis management team who have self-isolated and um, they are operating a split shift um, operation to reduce office occupancy and have a stringent sanitisation policy in place. Um, I'm currently working from home, but we do have a team um, in the office as well. The team understand that more than ever, we now have a very important role to play and that our response times must remain high in order to expedite a will search request for those following a bereavement or those wishing to register a will. As has always been possible, all of the certainty National Will Register services um, provided to support the legal profession can be accessed remotely 24 hours a day. And this has proved vital for the continuation of service requirements during COVID-19 and helps with legal professionals who are working remotely and flexibly um, during this time that we're seeing at present. And uh, as I checked on Sunday, um, whilst I was putting this presentation together, I want to say kudos to there's a solicitor submitting will searches very late on Sunday night um, online. So <laughs> you are working very flexibly at the moment. Um, so can I go on to the next slide, please? So we as professionals are currently seeing a legal landscape that we've not seen before and we're having to think quite intuitively about how we provide a will writing service and how we can assist clients in locating a loved one's will and personal documentation following their death in such unusual circumstances. New problems have arisen on locating a will and finding essential personal documentation quickly following a bereavement during COVID-19. Um, we have identified that this is because an individual is either self-isolating and does not want to visit the deceased home to search for evidence of a will, they have contracted COVID-19 themselves, or they are indeed dealing with a deceased person who is a victim of COVID-19. And I'm sorry to sound morbid, but we do operate in the deceased industry. Um, I wanted to just highlight, um, bring home what we're dealing with on the front line in the Certainty Will Search team at Certainty the National Will Register. Um, and for context, um, shortly after the lockdown, um, we received a phone call from a chap, a very distressed um, chap who had COVID himself and his, um, his wife had just passed away um, and he had explained that before lockdown was put in place there was a family gathering on a Sunday for Sunday lunch I believe and they had um, all contracted COVID-19 and his wife had passed away. Since then um, that same chap has called us two more times because his brother-in-law has passed away and his sister-in-law has passed away and um, he's still sick himself so he's trying to not only come to terms with the horrendous situation he's finding himself in but also um, the fact that um, he can't go into people's houses because he's still in isolation he's still sick himself and he is trying to um, uh, do the best he can um, to help a, um, uh, get the person documentation together so we have been supporting him with tracing um, establishing if there is a will for those that have passed away um, or if there is a later will and um, we did also have a phone call yesterday from a son who is working in Ireland but he's actually from the UK and um, his father has passed away from coronavirus last week but he is unable to travel to um, go to his family home and start going through personal documentation but he's still on a um, time scale to understand um, what his father's funeral wishes are um, and also um, what his next steps are when, when, when a loved one has passed away so um, very distressing time and these are just the two um, conversations that have struck home to me um, recently um, but we are trying to sort of navigate by using our services to support people and the professionals that support these members of the public at this time. So, um, so Certainty Will Search is, as I've touched on, it's a remotely accessible service that can help to locate any wills that a deceased may have written. 
So Certainty Will Search checks the national will register for wills that have been registered and for wills that have not been registered using a system we've developed called REACH. So a REACH will search is a nationwide geographically targeted search for wills that have not been registered amongst Certainty member and non-member law firms and professional will writers from recognised will writing organisations including the Institute of Professional Will Writers and the Society of Will Writers. As Ali explained, um, the landmark financial asset search is an essential step in establishing the financial assets of a deceased. And this does include the search of the National Will Register to check for registered wills. Um, so it is important to consider that there is an additional search as well that you could do to search for wills that have not been registered. And that is frequently added on by um, frequent users of the landmark asset search um, to conduct a reach search in addition for that um, belt and braces approach. So to understand the importance of using um, both certainty will searches, um, although this percentage is shrinking as um, we move through time, um, about 50% of all wills that are found were wills that had not been registered. So that's been through using the REACH search system. So it's just an important statistic um, there for you to think about, particularly if you haven't registered all of your own firm's wills, there is an option to search for wills that have not been registered. Registered. Um, so this brings me um, nicely on to one of my most favourite statistics um, born out of our ops department um, and it hits home about the importance of searching for a will even if it is just to check and proceed with the will that you have been presented with or if it is de deemed as an intestacy and that's at least one in ten certainty will searches results in a will being found where one was not where one was thought never to have been written or the will being used to distribute the estate had been superseded by a newer found will so for context that's around 10 percent of found wills um, using the certainty will search were not known about so if a certainty will search had not been conducted to establish this, I would love to know what would have happened to those estates. Um, so if we could go to the next slide please Claire. So it was reported that the National Will Register has seen an increase in people searching for wills during the COVID-19 pandemic. And from feedback there are several reasons why this is the case and I'm sure you can resonate with some of these. So access the will quickly to understand if there are any funeral wishes contained within it. Commence probate faster, especially if they're in a financially vulnerable situation at the moment. To search for will because they are either self-isolating, they do not want to enter the home of others who may have or are suffering with COVID-19, or enter the, victim, the home of the victim of the virus to look for evidence of a will. And also just to reduce their emotional distress by understanding if a will exists and where the last version is stored. So last week I um, ran a webinar with um, Thomas Dumont QC, I'm sure you've all heard of him, and that was in relation to the execution of wills during lockdown. And in his webinar he interestingly stated that contentious probate professionals are likely to see a boom period of cases because of this pandemic. So we as professionals have services remotely accessible to us, such as the Landmark Financial Asset Search and um, the Certainty Will Search Service. And they are available to us to mitigate against the possibility of a probate matter becoming contentious for reasons that could have been avoided. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so hopefully that little whistle stop tool has helped on the search side and it's I'm sure prompted if you have not um, used this before or maybe not for a little while um, you want to understand how um, simple it is to search for a will. So um, the good thing is all of these methods are um, access remotely accessible and online. So the online search is the fastest way to submit your certainty will search. Um, if your firm does not have an account with certainty, you can simply visit nationalwillregister.co.uk and it's very obvious to navigate to the will search section of the website. Um, if you do have um, an account with certainty um, and your firm does have an account, um, you can log into certaintysolicitors.co.uk uk where you can start to process those searches um, and it's uh, worth noting as well that there is a portal for you to submit your landmark financial asset searches through there as well just to keep it all uh, neat and tidy in one place for you 
um, if um, you want to discuss a matter that you're presently dealing with, we do have an amazing Wheel Search team and they're on standby via live chat and telephone and of course email if you prefer written communication. Um, and these are the details that you can access um, them presented. So of course the live chat is available online if you visit the website. Uh, next slide please. So legal professionals are facing a challenge at present and are having to adapt their way of working in order to adhere to the social distancing measures. I'm hoping get further relaxed in the next few weeks um, uh, while still ensuring that they are following the legal requirements of making a valid will as outlined in the Wills Act of 1837. So from witnessing wills through windows to exchanging documents between cars, um, and I welcome any other innovative ways that you're currently executing wills, um, solicitors and will writing professionals have had to come up with these ways to answer the increasing demand for will writing at this time, um, but also by um, adhering to guidelines. So following the execution of the will, it's therefore vitally important to have that will registered to denote its existence for the time it needs to be searched for and found quickly and confidentially. So when a will is registered, um, apologies if you already know this, but when a will is registered, the National Will Register does not see or store a copy of that will to protect, protect its confidential contents. It records the basic details of the testator, the date of the will and the date the will was signed and where the hard copy original is stored so that when the will is searched for and a match is made the certainty will search team will notify you the custodian of the will that the testator has passed away and their will is being searched for we will then provide you with the next steps um, including the need to have sight of the death certificate and of course proof of id before you can disclose the existence of the will to the searcher Unless with documented permission, certainty the National Will Register does not disclose the existence of the will to the searcher. So the resulting effect of that is that when a certainty will search is activated, it quickly establishes if there is a match against a registered will. I think the record is about 30 seconds from a will being started, a will search being started. Um, the firm is then also in the best position to receive that probate work for the will that they've safely kept in their storage. For context, um, the highest reported amount of additional probate work received due to their wills being registered, rest, registered by a single firm is 86 probates. So if you times that by your average probate fee for your firm, it's, it was a worthwhile exercise for that firm. And the firm did state that if their wills had not been registered, then they would have not won the probate work. And they admit in the majority of cases, they would not have known their clients had died. If there is no unknown or later will found as a result of the certainty will search, i.e. you've been presented with a will and they believe it's the latest will, or they do believe it is an intestacy, you can then proceed with confidence um, that a recognised will search has been used to establish that the latest will held is the latest will and check that no other will, will exist when administering an intestate estate. Um, as a result of that, you receive a certainty will search report that you can keep on file. Uh, next slide, please. So following this very concise overview of the situation at present and how the National Will Register is supporting those during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I suppose you have a couple of questions that you may be asking yourself. Um, and these are, and they come up, um, crop up all the time when I speak to legal professionals is, are all our firm's wills held in storage registered with the National Will Register? And also how do we register all of our firm's wills? So, it makes logical sense to register an individual one, but how do we get all of our wills registered? And we do have a system in place um, which has led to the um, huge number of wills that get registered in a single day as I presented earlier in the presentation. Next slide, please. So, um, we've got a very simple process in place to be able to register your firm's wills and it's a very timely webinar so thank you Bristol Law Society because we are right in the middle of our annual initiative called Free Will Registration Month 
and this quite simply provides law firms with the opportunity to register all of your wills um, in your archives for free. Um, so, and that does uh, run out at the 18th of June 2020. So, um, registering a will does not only protect clients against the incorrect distribution of an estate, as I've touched on, and the issues that surround an unknown will coming to light, but also the loss of probate work because the will at the law firm that wrote and stored it are unknown to the executors and beneficiaries, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. So any wills made prior to May 2020 can be registered for free. And there's two very simple ways that you can uh, register your wills. If you would like to register your will for free, um, you can visit the will registration page on nationalwillregister.co.uk. Simply complete the form and enter the free will registration code that you can see on the screen there. And that's it. Uh, once you've um, submitted it, you'll receive a certificate of registration and confirmation that that will has been registered for your client or yourself if you uh, want to register your own will. Um, if you want to register your will bank for free, so as I say, we've registered 47,000 for one firm in a day. Um, we have a very slick system in place and providing that you've got your will bank or records of whose wills um, you've got in storage in an electronic format, we can um, register those very quickly for you. So in order to just go through that proce process and not bore you with the um, technical details on this webinar, um, either speak to myself or call um, the telephone number in front of you and we've got a wonderful team that can help you just go through those steps of the process. So um, we've got three minutes left before <laughs> midday so it's quite timely. So on that note um, thank you so much and uh, if there are any questions I'll be delighted to answer them. <laughs>